Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in a hospital sitting across from a psychiatrist. She was telling me that I was bipolar. I was released from hospital with a bunch of medication and basically laid on the couch for about a week before I could even shake the dust from my head. I put music on and put my whole iTunes library on shuffle. What I was doing is blocking out the noise in my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using music as a way to escape. A couple days after getting back from the hospital, I wrote in my notebook the words scream therapy. Beside that, I wrote book and podcast. My idea was that I would write a book about the link between punk rock and mental health. About a year and a half later, I still hadn't really had a chance to start the project. I was struggling through the disorder, trying to figure it all out. Now I'm to the point where I'm actually doing it. Starting with this podcast, I'm also working on the book through a master's program. They say there are three stages of healing. The illness, the recovery, and the transformation. I feel like I'm somewhere between steps two and three, and I hope by doing this project, it will help not only myself, but those who are listening. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This is a chance to look at that through the lens of different guests with the hopes of understanding these very challenging issues. This is Screen Therapy. I attended one of Shauna Potter's workshops on safer spaces at Fest in Gainesville, Florida a couple years ago. I was coming off an episode of Hypomania, just being so excited about the festival it drove me higher than I usually am, and I started to drop into depression during her workshop. I was crying and just feeling really low about the whole thing. But what struck me about Shauna's talk was how important it is to make our venues, meeting places, cafes, and other businesses safer for everyone. Personally, I often get anxious and hypervigilant at shows, watching out for everybody but myself, making sure everybody is safe. I sometimes forget that I'm there to watch a band. When I'm manic, I'm the first person to stage dive, crowd surf. When I'm feeling depressed, I cry at my favorite lyrics. Others deal with their own forms of anxiety, panic attacks, re-traumatization, mood episodes and delusions at shows. In a perfect world, folks with mental illnesses, trauma, addictions, and disabilities would have a safe space to go. But this isn't a perfect world, so we can only hope to make these spaces safer. Hi, Jason, and everyone listening to Scream Therapy. My name is Shauna Potter. I'm the front person for War on Women, which is a political, feminist, hardcore punk band. I'm also the author of Making Spaces Safer, a guide to giving harassment the boot wherever you work, play, and gather. And that is a book I wrote and published last year that is based on my experience training venues and spaces and organizations of all kinds to make their space safer and more welcoming for people that experience harassment. One of the big reasons why I brought you on the podcast, Shauna, was to talk about uh, how some of those applications in your book can be used for folks with mental health challenges and maybe even with the punk scene and how folks uh, with mental health issues have been accepted and brought into the scene over the years. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm sure everyone says this or should say this, you know, I'm not a mental health professional, but the discussion part of this is really important. And I certainly know a lot of tips and tricks for self-advocacy, as well as things that people can do to be better allies to people with mental health issues or and disabilities of all kinds, really. From what you've seen, because you've been doing punk for a long time and obviously playing a lot of shows over the years, uh, what are you seeing in regards to uh, folks with disabilities and how they are treated by the punk scene in general? I think it varies, honestly. I've toured internationally as well as just in the U.S. It just, every, every scene is different. Every venue is different. And so that's kind of part of the problem. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is that I wanted a more consistent response to the daily struggles that people face I want people to go into a venue and that there be a bare minimum of what to expect from that space. So, you know, I've seen a lot of venues that just totally don't think about 
the fact that people are struggling and might need a little help to go see their favorite band play. I've also played these big places that are legally required to do some things. And so they do them so that they're not breaking the law, but they don't necessarily care about the reasons why they're being done, or they certainly don't pick up the slack for things that aren't covered under the law or aren't as explicit. And then there's lots of spaces that um, it's usually because a member or someone really involved in that space or community has a disability or mental health issue. And that's why that space is aware of it and can kind of go the extra mile for folks. So I've, I've seen a lot of different things and I'd like to catch us all up personally. Yeah. A lot of the book is advice for folks that are running venues. And like you said, organizations, different kinds of spaces. What can people that do those things do to advocate for people with mental health issues? So there are certain things that you've seen that they can do that are quite effective. So that's a bit, very big question, right? Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of different answers. So some things that are coming to mind are overt signage, letting people know that if they have an issue with something, that there is someone to talk to, that there's someone at this venue that is trained in active listening and grounding techniques so they can keep someone calm until they can get them the help that they might need. Maybe they need more professional help or need to talk to someone, and that's fine. I think it's good for people to know that just because you work at a club, you're not required to be a trained counselor. Yeah. You're not a psychologist. You're not. It's okay if you're not a mental health expert. The point is to make sure that someone is calm enough and feels safe enough that you can then get them whatever help they might need. And sometimes all they need is just to take a moment and be grounded by someone that's empathetic to what they're going through. That might be it. But if they need more, you should have resources on hand, you know, hotlines to call, a space to maybe take them away that's quieter, away from flashing lights, where they can make a call in private. It's kind of basic human decency things yeah. if you see someone in crisis. But I, I find that most people want a checklist, like a to-do list. And so I've done that as much as I can in this book, Making Spaces Safer, but it's always worth talking more about. So yeah. I say proactive signage, having someone on hand that knows grounding techniques, having a space to take people. And a trend I've seen lately, it's gaining more traction, is signage that lets people know whether or not there are strobe lights that yeah. evening or, or smoke or, or something like that. Things that people might not think of when they just want to go see a band play. I would imagine that a lot of response to folks that are having anxiety attacks or, or severe episodes is that sort of freezing response, like, what the heck do I do and how do I deal with this? Sure. And so it's nice to have some guidelines. In general, what do you see folks at venues doing when these sort of things come up? I don't see it a lot, I'll be honest. Well, I can't be everywhere at once, so that, that's one yeah. thing. I try to, to, you know, be a good activist, but I can't see everything that happens. Um <laughs> And so I can only speak to what I what I have seen. And one thing that I have noticed over the years is that not a lot of people that attend venues trust the people working there to respond to whatever they're going through in an understanding way, yeah. right? And And why should they, right? I'm just going to see a band play or whatever. I don't know this person behind the bar. And a lot of times, if you feel like there's a stigma attached to something you're going through, you don't necessarily want to tell strangers about it because yeah. you don't know how they're going to react. They could um, cause you secondary traumatization, which is a term that applies to the idea that there's an original trauma, an original triggering act, maybe. And then there's the act of telling someone that doesn't believe you or dismisses you, doesn't take you seriously, that causes a secondary traumatization and it actually contributes to the overall feeling of being overwhelmed, frustrated, scared, general trauma. And so, of course, we don't know if the person behind the bar is going to be cool, if we tell them what we're going through. And sometimes that makes it easier to just not tell anyone. Yeah. So you struggle alone. And I think that's too bad. And so what I want to see more of, that's another reason for that overt signage, is so that people can relax a little bit and know that if they do have some sort of episode or they need a little bit of help, that they can talk to someone. Even if it's not the first person you see, if you're closest to the bartender, but they're too busy or they're not the one that's trained, they should be able to say, okay, 
I see you're going through something. Let me go ahead and grab the person who can help you and I'll be right back. You know, like get the right person and you can still be nice about the fact that it might not be you in that moment. So you should have a few people that are ready to do that. And if they're not specifically trained in active listening or grounding techniques, it's, it's really easy for everybody to learn. So how would you suggest that people practice active listening? You know, it's such a good life skill. It's really not just for moments of crisis. <laughs> yeah. It's so important in our relationships, our friendships, working with people, whether you chose to work with them or not. Active listening is huge. It's just a part of healthy communication. So it's something, it's something for everyone to learn no matter what. And so it's also hard. It can be hard, actually. You know the stuff, but you have to practice it to get better at it. You're not going to be really good at it at first because especially in today's super polarized, argumentative, I'm going to leave a mean comment and then check out world we live in. It's easy to just blast all your anger and trauma at someone, not really think about the fact that they are also a person hanging on to their own feelings and potential trauma. And, you know, you don't know their story. And so I just think everyone should learn active listening and then practice it with a friend or whatever. And so the most basic parts of active listening, it's really built on this idea that you have two ears and only one mouth, right? So you should be listening. You should actually be listening to what someone is saying. You should be listening more than you're talking. And you should just kind of look look at them, right? Like put the phone down, look them in the eye, gentle eye contact, gentle head nodding, You're doing it right now, even though we are speaking online, but you're giving me little, little like, yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah. yeah." That little feedback to tell me that you're still there. If we were in the same room, those little moments, let me know you're there, Mm -hmm. right? That you're there with me, uh, that you're listening to me. And it's really important. And so the, the next level of active listening is actually giving some of that language back. It's called mirroring their language. So if you were to tell me that you just went through something really tough or you're really freaked out and you're upset, when you're ramping down, first I'm letting you speak, I could say, I'm so sorry, I would be freaked out too or I would be upset too. Whatever word you used, I would use it to let you know I heard what you said. I know how you're feeling. So I think that's really, really important. And mostly people just want to be heard. It's very difficult to have that kind of important connection as human beings like we need to feel connected to other human beings and we don't get it as much as we used to and so just having someone listen to you and believe you take what you're saying at face value it's huge and it can really be the most important thing when you run into folks who you know are having some sort of a issue or anxiety attack what do you do to ground them because we talked a little bit about grounding techniques but what practical application of that I don't know if your your listeners are aware of grounding techniques, if you talked about it before, or if they've heard of them and maybe don't know what they are and why you use them. But just in case, when someone's in crisis mode, it means that in the back of their brain, they're reliving some traumatic event. And that traumatic event either just happened, and that's why they're in crisis mode, or they experienced something that triggered a memory Uh, of the last time they were in crisis. Your brain doesn't know the difference necessarily in the moment. It just knows it has to protect itself, right? And it gets overwhelmed by, by reliving this original trauma. So if someone is in the back of their brain like that, figuratively speaking, I'm not a scientist, (laughs) (laughs) surprise. Well, usually they can't tell us what they need in that moment. They're not going to be able to verbalize what will help them. And so to get them out of that traumatic memory, we need to bring them back to the present. And we do that by using grounding techniques. So we want them to just be in the moment with us so they can start telling us what's going to be most helpful to them. The most common one and the easiest one to do is is when you realize, okay, this person is it doesn't seem like they're listening to me or they're sobbing uncontrollably or they seem like they're hyperventilating. They're looking all around. They can't focus. They're not telling me anything, whatever, however it presents itself. It can look a lot of different ways, but they're not, they're not getting their message to you. They're not answering your question. So 
the first thing you can do is just say, okay, I see you're upset. We're going to take a deep breath. So why don't you breathe in with me? We're going to breathe in three, one, two, three. We're going to breathe out one, two, three. I'm actually doing it. This is cool. Exactly. That's the beautiful thing. Your body knows what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Your body will take over and start to breathe. And that steady breath can calm our systems down enough to where we can begin to focus on what's actually going on. Yeah. It's so basic, but so beautiful. And so just start that breathing with them, start counting, their body will start to take over, they'll start to do it with you. And it really helps if someone's hyperventilating, if for some reason that's not working or it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, you can have someone name five things they see, five things they hear, and five things they feel. And so what that does is it forces someone to look around the room and actually take in their present surroundings. Mm -hmm. With doing that, you should be able to get them to the point where they can say, here's what's happening with me, or here's what I need right now, or whatever. And you might have to ask, what do you need right now? How can I help? Very non-victim blamey questions. We don't want to say, what is going on with you? Or (laughs) why are you being like this? Or we we want to we want to ask like how how can i help you how can i get you to a calm place what do you need right now do you need medical attention what's the best thing for you right now like they're going to know they just might need you to prompt them by by asking that question after you've calmed them down with grounding techniques yeah one of the things that i love about punk rock and i'm sure you know you've you've experienced this in some way mm-hmm. as well is just how people do run in packs. They are very supportive of each other. You have some great friends that you meet through the punk scene, and we all have a lot of things in common. One of the things that I realized uh, when I had my mental health breakdown was that a lot of my friends were dealing with a lot of the same things. And I was like, maybe that's why I'm part of this scene is we're all kind of dealing with the same things. We all have things in common. What have you seen in regards to that over the years of uh, playing punk shows? You know, I think I've seen just more people that are willing to be open about what they're going through, just yeah. more awareness, more language around it, more acceptance that being neurotypical is, I guess, statistically it's typical. Again, not a scientist. So I don't have the numbers in front of me, but neurotypical to me, it, it should not mean positive or negative. It should not have a judgment attached to it, just like neuroatypical should not have a judgment attached to it. So what I think that I'm seeing is that people are more accepting that for some folks to be neurotypical, that means some folks are neuroatypical and yeah. that there's just that diversity out there. Frankly, how could there not be with this many damn people on the planet? How could we not all be <laughs> diverse in all the ways that are possible? Mm-hmm. So People being open and and self-advocating and talking about it themselves, that helps their friends and people close to be able to bring it up and be better allies when they hear something off or weird or let people know like, oh, hey, by the way, if we're going to play here tonight, so-and-so is epileptic and so we can't have any stress, you know, like just making it like, yep, this is a thing, not bad or good. This is just what's happening. People exist and they're all different and encouraging that talk around it just helps normalize it and helps people build their skills and strategies around accommodating people. I really appreciate what you, you're saying about helping folks at the venues with different techniques. We talked about grounding. We talked about active listening. Are there other things that can be done with folks that are having either severe episodes or, like we said, anxiety attacks? Yeah, I I think signs are a big thing and and training is a big thing. Um, So that's already been covered. I think some other things I go through in the book are, you know, there's some specific stuff like have a place where someone can sit. Not everyone can stand for that long. And so I certainly get a little bit more into physical limitations or disabilities in the book. But having a quiet place to sit away from giant crowds, that can apply to anyone, right? And there's other specifics, but I think the overall idea is that whatever the legal requirements might be, and also, duh, there are spaces that are technically not legal, you still have a responsibility to the people in your space, whether your space is legal or not. You need to make sure they're physically safe and work towards making them mentally safe and secure. So those basic things, but also the idea that there are things you can be doing that show people 
that you expect and welcome them in your space. And so any preparation you can do, any proactive measures you can take, plans in place, signs, trainings, like specific protocols, specific allowances for people, it just shows them that they can come to your space and have a good time and that if something happens and they need your help, you know what to do and you'll be there. And that helps build trust and they'll keep coming. So I think that most folks should maybe go that extra step and talk to some organizations uh, in their community, right? And talk to their, their friends and family that are experiencing these issues and, you know, do their own research and see what's out there and also what their people that are closest to them, what they want from a venue, what would help. Like when your friend tells you why they had to leave that other place the other night, pay attention and see if you can't find a workaround, find a solution so that no one ever feels like that in your space. Just that idea that there is always more to do and the information's out there. You just got to do the research. I think that is vital and making sure people know that they are welcome in your space. You do that by saying, hey, we expect you to be here. It's so small, but when I go to some punk house and there's no toilet paper and no soap, I'm like, oh, you don't want me here. It's like you're not even anticipating that a woman might show up. And I say that full caveat, cisgender woman, like fully embracing that part about me, raised femme, et cetera, et cetera. Like I I need soap. I need toilet paper. That's just the reality. (laughs) So there are obviously more things we can do for more people. So if you've got toilet paper, congratulations. Find five other things you can do for people. (laughs) Yeah. How do you think the punk scene can be a safer space for folks who are dealing with mental health challenges, mental illness? Everything always starts with listening and people being able to tell their stories. And so I think that's happening more and more. So when people actually tell their stories or tell us what it's like for them, we have to listen and we have to learn from it and implement what we can, the lessons we learn. If you, if you go to a show and you have some sort of episode, breakdown, anxiety, whatever, it's totally reasonable that your friends or whoever's there or working the bar, that they're not going to be a trained medical professional. We can't actually expect that. But what if we could expect people to be completely non-judgmental about what you're going through? What if we could expect full-on empathy and the desire to get you from a place of unrest to rest? And you have the number at the ready for who you should call, or you have the location for the medicine or what, whatever. That you talk to your friend in advance to see what's the plan if you do have an episode. Like, what do I need to know? How can I best help? That you prepare for what you can do and be the most understanding and empathetic that you can. That is reasonable. Hoping that everyone around you is a full-on medical expert, is that's obviously unreasonable. But there's so much that we can do. I say that as an ally. Like, there's so much that we as allies can do to... One, just acknowledge that there's a lot of different issues out there and they're all going to have their own thing. And even within the same mental health issues, there is some diversity, right? My friends with anxiety issues, it's not like I can tell them what they need to do to calm down. I need to, <laughs> I need to, I need to know their best way and then try to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's like telling them what kind of medicine to take and there's just everybody has a different yeah. reaction to every kind of medicine and There's no use trying to give advice, just like you said, active listening and support and all the good things. Yeah. And then just following through, getting them the resource they need, checking in on them later when they're in the space to do so. And I'm I'm talking, this is with friends, so you could speak this way. You can't speak this way to strangers, but with a friend, you can, as an ally, you can say like, did I do right by you the other night? Is there anything that you need me to do better? I think that's too much to ask a stranger. You know, we're not telling people to have strangers educate them, put that burden on them. But I I think with someone you're close to, there's no reason not to see if there's any better way that you can help. And it will just lead to more education and help in a situation where maybe you, you are with strangers, but you can still be of service to someone. You're really doing a lot of great work 
with helping people create safer spaces, including safer spaces with folks that are dealing with mental health issues. So on behalf of myself, (laughs) I want to say thank you so much for being here. (laughs) I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. I really appreciate it. If there's anyone out there that reads my book and finds um, room for improvement, especially as far as how we help people with mental health issues and creating safer spaces, if I, if I just missed a tactic that you like or has worked for you, I'd love to include it in any second edition that I do in the future. So you can email me at makingspacesafer at gmail.com. And I also am hireable to lead Safer Spaces workshops. So if you've got any of that corporate money out there, university (laughs) money, (laughs) please let me know and maybe I'll get off food stamps eventually. Thanks again for listening to Scream Therapy. If you want to reach out, you can message me at soundcloud.com slash therapy. Until next time, take care of yourself and be well.